Good afternoon to you. 406 Now News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up today, 430, Tim Carney is here. He's got a brand new book coming out on American families and what's up with our culture right now. A deep, interesting conversation ahead with Tim. Miranda Devine will be here at 5 o'clock. The great Miranda Devine from the New York Post. We'll talk to her about the latest revelations in the Biden family's financial arrangements. And Tyler O'Neill from the Daily Signal is here at 530 as we take a close look at one of the most corrupt districts in the entire country. It's a fascinating story there. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Yeah, we do have uh, brand new information on Biden family finances. As I mentioned, Miranda will be discussing that with us. Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer made this announcement at noon today. President Joe Biden claimed there was an absolute wall between his official government duties and his family's influence peddling schemes. This was a lie. President Joe Biden claimed his family didn't receive money from China. This was a lie. President Joe Biden claimed he never spoke to his son, Hunter Biden, about the Biden's family's shady business dealings. This was a lie. Now, Hunter Biden's legal team and the White House's media allies claim Hunter's corporate entities never made payments directly to Joe Biden. We can officially add this latest talking point to the list of lies. Today, the House Oversight Committee is releasing subpoenaed bank records that show Hunter Biden's business entity, a Wasco PC, made direct monthly payments to Joe Biden. This wasn't a payment from Hunter Biden's personal account but an account for his corporation that received payments from China and other shady corners of the world. At this moment, Hunter Biden is under an investigation by the Department of Justice for using a Wasco PC for tax evasion and other serious crimes. And based on whistleblower testimony, we know the Justice Department made a concerted effort to prevent investigators from asking questions about Joe Biden. I wonder why. The more we learn, it appears the Justice Department was trying to cover up for the Bidens until brave IRS whistleblowers came forward and a federal judge rejected the sweetheart plea deal. Payments from Hunter's business entity to Joe Biden are now part of a pattern revealing Joe Biden knew about, participated in, and benefited from his family's influence peddling schemes. When Joe Biden was vice president, he spoke by phone, attended dinners, and had coffee with his son's foreign business associates. He allowed his son to catch a ride on Air Force Two at least a dozen times to sell the Biden brand around the world. Hunter Biden requested office keys to be made for his office mate, Joe Biden, in space he planned to share with a Chinese energy company. We've revealed how Joe Biden received checks from his family that were funded by the Biden's influence peddling schemes with China, no less. The House Oversight Committee continues to investigate Joe Biden's involvement in his family's domestic and international business schemes at a rapid pace. We will continue to uncover the facts and provide transparency about the findings of our investigation. President Biden and his family must be held accountable for this blatant corruption. The American people expect no less. All right. So let's let's get to a couple things. One, you know, the media keep on insisting that there is no evidence whatsoever that Joe Biden did anything wrong. How many times does he have to lie to you before you say, you know what, there may be something here. Biden has lied a lot about all of this. Biden has lied about his son receiving money from China. Biden has lied about his knowledge of his son's business dealings. Biden has lied constantly to the American press, and yet they still carry his water. That's the kind of relationship they have. It's an abusive one. They'll do what they'll, they'll, they'll keep gaslighting on his behalf, despite the fact that he keeps abusing them, right? So that's that's happened throughout this saga. Also, sometimes you'll say you'll hear things like, oh, this only happened when Biden was this is as the goalposts shift. This all this all only happened when Biden was uh, out of the vice presidency and before he was president of the United States. He was free to meet with business partners, these types of things. But much of the activity alleged and not only alleged, but proven happened while Joe Biden was vice president of the United States. In the alleged category, you have the FD, FD 1023 form which is just an FBI form for a, for a confidential human source. This was a paid informant of the FBI, somebody who was in good standing, had a long-term relationship with the FBI. 
who was uh, who had proven to be very trustworthy and given them a tremendous amount of important, lead worthy information, uh, uh, the kind of information worth following. And they indicated that Joe Biden was absolutely bribed in order to get the Ukrainian prosecutor fired. And he was bribed by the head of Burisma, Slavchevsky. And so this is, you know, this, this, this keeps on happening, right? So we hear those allegations. He was referred to as the big guy by that source, by the way. That's also what Hunter Biden's business partners referred to him as. And you've also got behavior. You have times where Joe Biden is meeting, including in the spring of 2015, he's got a dinner with Vadim Posarsky, the head, one of the, one of the executives with Burisma, uh, at Cafe Milano right here in Washington, D.C. That was during Biden's vice presidency, meaning he was there with Secret Service in tow as vice president of the United States, meeting with Hunter Biden's business partners. He also had a spring 2014 dinner with a Russian oligarch by the name of Elena Batarina. That was while Joe Biden was vice president of the United States. Batarina paid millions of dollars to the Biden family. And the end result is that when they finally decided to level sanctions against various Russian oligarchs, every single one of them that they could get sanctions to drop sanctions on, guess who they didn't put sanctions on? Elena Batarina. How did she get away with it? How did she, how, how was she the one Russian oligarch who didn't get slapped with sanctions? Well, I don't know. Maybe it helped that she wired three and a half million dollars to a shell company run by the Bidens in 2014, the same year that she met with Joe. So the evidence is is immense here. It's just over the top. Meanwhile, Democrats, including this uh, delegate Stacy Plaskett uh, from the Virgin Islands, she uh, she she attends Congress. She has she's a front row seat to a lot of the activity, but she has no voting power whatsoever. Here's Stacy Plaskett. They have not even their own witnesses that they brought forward been able to find a nexus between any of the allegations of Hunter Biden mm -hmm. and the president, uh, Joe Biden, or even when he was vice president, Joe Biden. There's no nexus. There's no there there. They literally make it up. They just make it up. They're not going to. And no, nobody bothers to address like, hey, didn't Biden lie about this? Biden stood on a debate stage and said his money, his kid received no money from China. That's open and shut. That's a lie. So nobody takes that seriously. Instead, they they play this game. And so she says that in the media. There's no follow-up questions. It's all it's all just nodding in agreement. Yeah, yeah, no, Biden's totally innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. Totally innocent. You see um, Ron DeSantis getting some attention this weekend for his remarks about impeachment. DeSantis uh, was on the Sunday shows and in indicated that basically Republicans shouldn't view impeachment as the only issue. He, the headline from the New York Post here, which uh, is instructive, DeSantis warns Republicans, GOP, against using impeachment probe of Biden as, quote, Trojan horse. Uh, he said he described efforts to formalize an impeachment inquiry as justifiable, but he urged Republicans to give due attention to issue that vo issues that voters care about. Quote, if you're doing the inquiry, which, again, I think is justifiable, you also have to be addressing all these other issues. He told Meet the Press in an interview Sunday. He cited the budget, border, and the economy. Quote, make sure you're not ignoring all these other issues and don't use that inquiry as a kind of a Trojan horse to not then meet your responsibilities and all these other things. He's right about that. He's right about that. And what did we say, you know, especially during Kevin McCarthy's tenure as Speaker of the House, how frequently have, did, did, did I say on this program, okay, that's great. I'm glad he's moving forward with this impeachment inquiry. That's all well and good. But you can't be just throwing out red meat all the time and hoping that we're distracted from the rest of the problems that befall our country. The impeachment inquiry can't be the only thing. It's an important thing, no question, especially when you have an out-of-control control president. The, the corruption is really, it's not even the highest-ranking problem for the Biden presidency. The highest-ranking problem for Biden is the tyranny, is the abuse of power, is the use of the Justice Department to crush his political opponents. Those abuses are out of control. It's the, it's the active decision to abandon our sovereignty on our southern border. That's, that's at, unfortunately, a higher tier concern than Biden family corruption. 
which of course ranks high, but not as high as that. So DeSantis is right about this point. Speaker Mike Johnson and all these other Republicans who are in leadership in the House can't think that the only thing that we get or that we need as the American people or as the conservative base, Republican base, that the only thing we need is an impeachment. <laughs> and like, that's, yeah, it's on the list, but it is not the top. It's not the top. We, we have a country where uh, people are meaningfully suffering and Washington's responsible for that. So it's your job to help us navigate a way out. Uh, and yet today you've got Joe Biden demanding more money for Ukraine. That's what's happening right now. They're not addressing. There's no, no border concerns whatsoever. Nothing. Nothing. It's just how can we get another $60 billion to Ukraine? And if we do that, we will officially have given Ukraine more money than we have given Israel over the last 75 years of the U.S. relationship with Israel. Did you know that? If we pass a $60 billion uh, tranche of money for Ukraine, we'll officially have given them more U.S. aid than we've given Israel in the entirety of our relationship with that country. That's what Biden's up to. Guess which country has enriched his family? Ukraine. Ukraine. Speaking of Israel, um, Pramila Jayapal, squad member, is getting a lot of attention this week, this weekend, for her remarks on CNN. She uh, doesn't want us to to look too closely at the rape of Israeli women on October 7th. She's like, yeah, I condemn that, but, 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 but. I want to ask you about uh, sexual violence. And the, it's kind of remarkable that this issue hasn't gotten enough attention uh, globally. Widespread use of rape, uh, brutal rape, sexual violence against Israeli women by Hamas. It hasn't gotten attention because the media are rooting against Israel. That's why. It, that's the whole reason. They don't want to talk about it because they don't want to establish the clarity, the moral clarity here in the eyes and ears of the of the consumers of these outlets. Um, I've seen a lot of progressive women, generally speaking, they're quick to defend women's rights and speak out against using rape as a, as a weapon of war, but downright silent on what we saw on October 7th and what might be happening inside Gaza right now to these hostages. Why is that? Yeah, there, there are all these, all the lefty women, the believe all women crowd, all the people who say they stand up for women, not standing up for women. Remember, this is one of the reasons the women's march fell apart, all the anti-Semitism going on within it. They, they can't stand up for women who are attacked, sexually assaulted, raped by Hamas, these terrorists. Here's how Congresswoman Jayapal answered. I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's true. I think we, we always talk about the impact of war on women in particular. In fact, I remember 20 years ago, I did a petition around the war in Iraq. Have you said, saying have that, you talked about it since oh, October absolutely. 7th? And I've condemned oh, totally. what Hamas has done. I've condemned Specifically all of women. the actions. Absolutely, the, the rape, the, of course. Of course, of course. I don't even know why you're asking me this, but we have to remember, Israel's the bad guy here, she says. She's asked about, okay, the rape of Israeli women, somehow Israel becomes the bad guy. But I think we have to remember that Israel is a democracy. That is why they are a strong ally of ours. And if they do not comply with international humanitarian law, they are bringing themselves to a place that makes it much more difficult strategically for them yeah. to be able to build the kinds of allies to keep public opinion yeah. with them. All right, they continue here. Uh, she says... Uh, we can't say, basically, this is, like she says Israel's committing war crimes now. So she, again, she's asked about the terror of Hamas. She turns it into Israel. Morally, I think we cannot say that one war crime deserves another. That is not what international humanitarian with, with, law says. Okay, with, with respect, I was just asking about the, the women, and you turned it back to Israel. I'm asking you about Hamas, in fact. I already answered your question, Dana. I already, already, already answered your question, Dana. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Rape is horrific. Sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Not, no, Israel, no. Uh, I'm sorry, Dana's about to make this very point. You don't see that this is not a universal truth of war. This is a Hamas thing, and they do it with glee, not just the murder, but the rape. In war situations, terrorist organizations. I saw reports, by the way, Hamas also raped men during that attack. Did you know that? Also, men and women like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. Mm -hmm. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestinians. Yeah. Fifteen thousand 
Palestinians have been killed in Israeli airstrikes, three quarters of whom and it's, are women and children. And it's horrible, but you're, you don't see Israeli soldiers raping um, Well, Dana, I think women. we're not, we're not, I, I don't want this to be the hierarchy of oppression. That's funny. That's your entire political party. I don't want this to be a hierarchy of oppression. This is literally how your entire political party operates. Hierarchies of, of oppression. <sighs> All right. Um, more on this in a moment. Also, uh, I want to get to the details here that uh, the left is canceling Hanukkah all over the place. You have all these various communities who are trying to put menorahs up, as you do, at Hanukkah. And uh, the left is canceling the menorahs because they're fearful that it may seem like they're supporting Israel. This is insanity. And it's right here in the United States. It's 422 now. <laughs> A lot of insanity to share with you. The left's going crazy. In Williamsburg, Virginia, there was supposed to be a Hanukkah celebration on December 10th. It's been canceled. Love Light Placemaking is the organizer of the second Sunday's Art and Music Festival in Williamsburg. The National Review reports that they have canceled the scheduled Hanukkah celebration, including the lighting of a menorah on December 10th, following concerns related to the Israel-Hamas conflict. What? Shirley Vermillion, the festival's founder, cited logistical challenges and sensitivity to the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict as the reason. Quote, the concern is of folks feeling like we are siding with one group over the other. Okay, that's, that, that's very dumb. That's very dumb. Meanwhile, a main town has also canceled their Star of David because they say it's offensive. Westbrook, Maine has removed a Star of David from their winter, winter lights display following complaints from Arab-American residents who found it offensive in light of the current war between Israel and Hamas in Palestine. Uh, a question about this today in the White House press briefing. Uh, another issue, um, many Jewish Americans this week will begin celebrating Hanukkah, and we've already seen some jurisdictions have had to alter or in some cases cancel what used to be public uh, celebrations of this holiday. Does the White House, does the administration have any um, evidence or concern about the safety of some of these demonstrations. And I also wonder if you could talk about um, what the White House's plans are to mark the holiday and if that's been impacted by the war. That's a very good question. Uh, obviously, over the past couple of weeks, since this certainly since this uh, war uh, started, um, we have seen the increase of anti-Semitism. Um, and, uh, you know, we understand the fear that people in the Jewish community must be feeling right now, which is why we have taken action to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that uh, people in that community feel protected. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna continue to do. I don't have any specifics uh, to lay out as we um, get closer to the holiday, but obviously we have seen an uptick uh, in anti-Semitism. We have seen an uptick in hate, uh, just more broadly in different communities, obviously, uh, uh, also in the Muslim community. And so we what? will do everything that we can uh, to make sure that these communities feel safe. It's crazy. And so what you have is the left threatening religious liberty yet again, to the point that you have Hanukkah celebrations being canceled in American cities for fear that it might look like they're supporting Israel? That's demented. Coming up, Tim Carney will talk about the current state of the American family. Well, good afternoon to you. 437 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up top of the hour, the New York Post's Miranda Devine joins us on all of the direct payments from Hunter Biden's company to Joe Biden, finding out about today. And then Tyler O'Neill is here from the Daily Signal at 530. You can join us, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Uh, you know, every generation kind of assesses that kids these days are different than when I was, when I was a child, it was totally different. And, and that's, I, I think it is true. It's like, it definitely changes over time. But is it changing for the better? Well, my next guest has written a, a deeply researched book on the subject. It comes out in March, but I couldn't wait for that. I wanted to talk to him about it now. The name of the book is Family Unfriendly. Tim Carney, the author, joins us on the phone. Hello, Tim. Good to have you with us, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Tim, you, you, uh, you're, on, you're on Twitter at TP Carney, and you, you started putting out a thread on this subject. But give me a sense of... What kind of research you undertook for the book and what, what you meant to do with this? What, what did you set out to do here? So the, the first research I did was um, getting married and having six children. 
So, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and realizing that that uh, makes us weird. I guess I'm a young Gen Xer and the millennials are the most numerous generation. And they uh, really, the birth rate dropped though once they became of childbearing age, right? When we should have been having a mini baby boom, yes, we had a baby bust. And that has sort of uh, bothered me for a decade since uh, Jonathan last wrote uh, What to Expect When No One's Expecting. I've been wondering if, when would this reverse itself? You know, we had the recession and then we had the best economy ever right before COVID and birth rates were still were much lower than yes. they had been during the recession and they were falling. Is and it is that record. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I just wonder, is that in your view, is that cultural, chemical or some combination of both? I mean, that, what... it's cultural. I mean, that really the, the fact that you, every explanation you see says, well, young people can't afford it. Housing prices uh, and housing prices is not a non factor, but, you know, student loans or whatever. Most of those explanations fell apart as I looked into uh, the economics of it, except for housing prices. But that was inadequate to explain what had happened. It's a contributor. And I really think the cultural issues are the, the, the problem here. First, that parenting culture is all crazy. Like parents are expected to put their kids in uh, travel teams and to helicopter them and to make sure. And, you know, forget about while women are pregnant, they're not supposed to have like deli meat or a glass of wine or a cup of coffee. So you have that whole cultural aspect of it. B, when I went to places like Israel or um, Mormon parts of Utah, I saw what a real family-friendly culture could look like, where people just make the decision. The culture has made the decision. No, parent, getting married and having kids is a normal part of adulthood. You don't have to do it, but we are going to kind of structure society around that being a normal thing to do. And finally, I think we've got values that don't align with uh with family that we're hyper individualistic we're over materialistic and in all these ways i think our culture is family and friendly and that's that's the argument of the book so in that case you see kids as an impediment to your materialism they're they're getting in the way of you enjoying your life and your convenience yeah and i don't even want to put it in terms of just selfishness as much as we think it's good to um to just focus entirely on your career um, and we think that that anything that distracts from that is somehow us not rising to our potential. And especially yeah. for women, um, they think uh, it's like betraying your sex if you take time off of your job to raise kids. That, um, do you feel like so, women women feel that much pressure against um, against prioritizing their children that you you saw it all over the place? Oh yeah, um, I definitely talk to women. All over, and even internationally in London, this one woman was like, "You know what I want to do? I want to get married and have six kids." Um, but that's really, she said, she's a, a British. She said it's shamed upon if my sort of life ambitions are not career ambitions. Mm -hmm. And so the <laughs> the sociology research I did on this, uh, a lot of it was really eye opening. But sometimes you read the introduction of these things. And then you read the findings and you start banging your head against the wall. There's this one paper that I cite in the book that said um, women are learning that uh, being a working mother is much harder than they thought. But what the data really showed was that women, when they're 18, you know, uh, millennials, when they were 18, said they really, really care about career. Those of those who really, really cared about career and had one child later were asked, they said, well, actually, family is more important than career. <laughs> So that idea that uh, women finally, that some women decided, oh, wait a second, I'm actually called to be a mother. The, the researchers couldn't handle that. They said, oh, well, somehow these women must have just given up on the idea of career. So anything that's pro-family gets cast as a, a negative thing, as as lowering your ambitions. And yes. so the, the kind of feminism that I fit in this book is saying, well, dads have to be more daddish. <laughs> Dad have to be more dadly, I guess would be the word I would use, that we have to, in the workplace, stand up in that five o'clock, say, oh, by the way, I got to go home. My family needs me. We have to, as bosses, tell all our employees, male and female, you know what? This job is really great. Your family's more important. That that's the sort of feminism we need. Instead, the feminism we've gotten is people saying, you, woman, can be a company man. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our family unfriendly culture. Yeah. It's fascinating. So you mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that's happening with parenting that's changed now 
is what the phenomenon we refer to as helicopter parenting, that parents are involved in every facet of their child's life uh, and, you know, whether the extracurricular, the regular curricular. Uh, and that's changed a lot since you were a kid. Gen X, we, we talk a lot about latchkey kids, like kids that yep. came and went from home and, and were kind of able to handle things on their own from a very young age. Um, how, how has that changed and, and how has that been an impediment to uh, good family building? Oh, there's tons of data on this. Let me put it this way. Dads, and I, I get this first part I think is good. Dads spend about 50% more time with their kids than dads did 50 years ago. Women spend more than twice as much time in the workplace than women did 50 years ago. Mothers still spend almost twice as much time taking care of their kids as mothers did 20 years ago. So we somehow decided that we need to double the amount of total parenting time that's going on with kids that we need to. And so some of this is just sort of bad expectations where parents think they need to ride their kids to demand the best outcomes. Yes. Spoiler alert, riding your kids does not get the best outcomes. But then I also point to how uh, society is built in a way, once you sort of uh, start to chip away at childhood independence, it becomes this vicious circle, this downward spiral, and it gets worse. And so, like, we rode our bikes to the Little League game, and mom and dad came if it was, was like, a nice night out <laughs> or if their friends were going to be there. Nowadays, kids, uh, it's, our communities aren't as walkable. I know it's not every conservative who talks about walkability, but when you're a parent, if your kid can ride their bike or walk, to their little league game, their friend's house, the local basketball court, that makes everybody in the family much happier. So that becomes harder. And then the, the spiral, the vicious circle continues. So the good baseball players are pulled out of the little league and they all go into travel ball. And then you show up to a little league game and there's nobody who can throw a strike and the whole league, it's boring and the league falls apart. And so then there's not even the option of the local rec league. And so there's tons of data about how parents are forced that parents are either choosing to or forced to, and it's a mixture of both, spend much more time, they're much more anxious, and that, that anxiety then trickles down yes. to their children and don't and the kids don't end up happier. Also they don't let their kids out of their sight, do they? No, and that's the other thing is to uh, just sometimes before I had a bunch of kids, when we had just one or two kids, I would occasionally get scolded for taking my eyes off. My you know, my five year old is on a jungle gym in a playground and not in like Newark or Fallujah, but in suburban Washington, D.C. Right. And, uh, you know, get a tisk tisk for losing track of my child. I'm supposed to know where they are at every moment. Um, and then as I got older and more confident, I started doing the opposite, not tisk tisking, but just sort of encouraging people. Hey, you know what? The, the kids are going to be fine. They just let's, let's let them go. And so parents would meet my kids at the playground and then email me and say, you know what? I realize that if your kids can be unattended at the playground, mine can too, especially yes. if there's a bunch of other kids. There. It does seem like there are more threats on the cell phones than there are at the playgrounds. Well, and I do think the tech, um, that that is the place where we need to worry about. Um, that what's online is an inhuman environment. You spend all this time fearing the human, fearing the alive. So what was COVID all about? Stay away from people. We instantly adopted that because I think the fearing of biology has somehow been worked into our culture. Um, but really what we have to fear is the inhuman. The apps that are built to sort of put us in this unreal circumstance, whether yes. it's just TikTok. You know, the way I put in the book is you spend decades building a culture for your family, for your kids to live in. And within a month or two of just uh, browsing on TikTok, they are taught a totally different worldview, one that's built around the individual, one that's not built around community, one that's not built around uh, tradition or family or anything like that. And so these are the, uh, yeah, these are the, the cultural things that we yes. do need to worry about I, is coming from the apps. I and was, that, the, sorry, go on. No, I just, on this point, I was talking to some, um, some friends this weekend. They also have young kids. We have we have nine year olds, fourth graders, and uh, that that conversation comes up. It's like, what does the future look like with the cell phones, the devices, and our 
And my view is that not only am I going to prolong that, like make stretch that out, delay it as long as possible, but also I figure what it's going to allow is my my daughter will have the opportunity to see the other kids around them, around her, and how they change when they get the mm-hmm. phones. And I want her, to, I want that to be instructive for her. I'm, this is my best, this is my plan. I don't know if it's going to work, but I want her to look around and and to say, okay, look how much Susie changed after she got her phone and what started happening and. That that's this is what we're on guard for. Well, and this is why I talk about culture, because I don't want to say that this is all about individual parenting decisions, because my wife and I are really aided in being low tech for our kids. Yeah. The support we get is from schools, private schools that don't allow the phones. Right. If you see a phone. If a teacher sees a phone, they take it away. Um, and so then that then trickles out. And so there's more parents who are like, you know what, you don't need a phone until you're driving. You don't need a smartphone until you go off and buy one in college. Uh, and so in that way, we are not, um, we're not worried about uh, our kids saying, hey, yeah. all my friends have it, because we know that's not true. So we get support from our community. And that's one of the key things that I do here. Again, I push back on individualism, but I also, I, I always joke, a wise woman said it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> Parents need community support. Yes. Now, whatever she meant by that, you know what I mean. Parents need community support yeah. in raising kids. So, and one of the things is a culture that's, that's anti-smartphone for young kids. So let me, if I can take this full circle, you mentioned that the birth rates have plummeted, so very, especially uh, millennials having very few kids. I, and my, my view is that the end result of this is that if small families mean low trust communities. So if you have if you have a small yeah. family and especially if you live in like the Washington DC area where everybody's transient, you don't really know your neighbors by and large unless you've been here for a long time. You don't know who your neighbors are. This is why parents kind of freak out about letting their kids out. Like, oh, the kid's going to ride a bike through the neighborhood, go to the local playground by themselves, you're not going to see them. The problem in that environment, in this environment is we have low trust communities. We don't know these people. These are all strangers. Whereas if you have and big families a, in well-developed communities yep. and, and, you know, uh, and busy churches and busy civic organizations, the busy local pool, you start to actually get to know everybody, then you don't, you're not so worried about your kid being on the run because no matter where they are, there's probably some neighbor nearby who knows them they, they can go to if necessary. Yep. And so we seek – we think that there – we seek government to help us where, you know, individual parents – are not enough. And this is what Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about 200 years ago, right? He said that um, that what's going to happen in America is that we're going to become a bunch of atomized individuals who seek protection from the large state to fill in the gap of what civil society should be doing. Yes. Civil society, the neighbors should be, I, and I talk to people and there are a lot of communities where this still happens. And some of them are, are some high income communities, but for the most part, they're, you know, religiously conservative communities, whether it's the Dutch reform or the Mormons or the Orthodox Jewish. Um, and there they say like the, the neighbors are raising my kids. <laughs> the older neighbor siblings are the ones who are teaching my kids how to throw a football, etc. And that that is, uh, we almost forget that the community can do that. And we think, okay, there's yeah. only so much my wife and I can do the rest we need the government to come in. That's certainly the way every Washington Post parenting columnist writes it. And what I try to do uh, with family and friendly is push back and say, no, it's about the culture. It's about the culture in a dozen ways, but it's certainly not just about individual parenting choices. And it's not just about economics. And it's not really, uh, we shouldn't be asking the government to help us. That yeah. said, government policy matters, right? Like, I, when I lived in Wheaton, Maryland, the, they kept making the roads wider and wider and wider and made it just less possible for our kids to even walk to the, the corner store. And government policy matters. And we have tax law that, um, you know, the whole Social Security system is proven to drive down birth rates, but they don't give any sort of accommodations to larger families in Social Security. So government is does play a role, but we certainly don't need, you know, massive government run daycares or, or, or ten thousand dollar child tax credit. That won't help. The book is Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. The author, Tim Carney. And Tim, can people pre order the book now? Yeah, it's already available for pre order on Amazon and uh, Barnesandnoble.com. 
All right. Family Unfriendly. The book comes out in March, uh, which means I'll be talking a lot more to Tim about this subject. It's one of the most important in the whole country right now. Thank you very much, Tim. Good to talk to you, sir. Republicans in Congress revealing the truth about more lies involving the Biden crime family. Now we know about the Biden bucks flowing directly from Hunter's business accounts to Joe Biden. We'll get into the details with Miranda Devine from the New York Post. The wonderful Miranda joins us next on the Vince Colonnais Show.